Hi, I'm Guy Denny, and we're going to talk about the wild prairies today. And we're along Buck Creek, and this is a nice stand of tall prairie grass. This is the big blue stem, or turkey foot grass. And if you take a look at the seed heads, it sort of resembles the long toenails of a, of a turkey, which is one of the names for it. Big blue stem is the other name for it. And I find as we travel the state, many people, many hounds are surprised to know the tall grass prairie is a part of our heritage. At the time of early settlement in Ohio, there was anywhere from a thousand, perhaps as many as 2,000 square miles of tall grass prairie in Ohio. The question is, how did, it, how did it get here? Why do we have tall grass prairie in Ohio when we're in the middle of the deciduous forest? And of course, the, the old antage is that Ohio was so heavily forested at the time of early settlement, the squirrel could travel from limb to limb all the way from the banks of the high river to the shores of the lake area and never touch ground. And it's probably true, but that squirrel would have had to bypass large areas of Ohio, particularly in central Ohio, uh, parts of northern Ohio, northwestern Ohio, where we have these remnant prairies of a post-glacial time when after the glacier receded from Ohio, the climate in the Midwest became warmer and drier than it is now. There, Ohio was glaciated three times and possibly four times, and after each glacial period there was this warming period where the climate was drier and warmer than present-day Ohio. And we don't know a whole lot about the earlier glaciers because there's about 100,000 years between each or more. But the last one, the Wisconsin, in, happened about 70 million years ago when glaciers came down from the North Country, covered most of Ohio, not all of Ohio. And then as it melted back and receded, we find that, oh, about oh, somewhere between six to 4,000 years ago, this part of the Midwest went through a warming, drying period, and that allowed uh, prairies to expand their way eastward from the from the Great Plains, and mostly because the what they call the hypothermal thermal interval, which was that period of warmth following the glacier, was a time of many severe, very long lasting droughts, which killed out a lot of the deciduous forest. And once the forests were gone, the prairie grasses could invade, because prairie grasses won't invade a forest normally because they can't survive in the shade of the forest. They do very well once the forest trees have died. They expanded, and this happened over thousands of years. So we even had bison in Ohio. And it's interesting, the last bison was shot in Ohio in Lawrence County back in, I think it was 1803. Prairie chickens, we think of prairie chickens as being something from very far out west. But actually, prairie chickens were once so abundant in Ohio that there was actually a hunting season on them that lasted to about 1903. The last prairie chicken was seen in 1890 something, uh, so it took a while to close the season down. but. At one time, we had prairie chickens, we had bison, we had elk in Ohio. In fact, back then, Ohio was the wild frontier. It was the West. So these prairie remnants that we have today are part of the living heritage of that period so long ago when prairie was much more a part of the landscape. And we have it right here in Ohio and all the animals that went with it. It's really kind of nifty. The big blue stem that I, that's behind me is just one of the major grasses that we find in the tall grass prairie area. There's some others like Indian grass, switch grass, prairie cord grass. These are very tall grasses. They get taller, taller than I am. They get well over six foot tall. And along with the prairie grasses come what we call the prairie wildflowers or prairie forbs, which is just a ecological name for anything that grows in a prairie that's not a grass or a woody species, essentially prairie wildflowers. And we have rich diversity of colors, many different species from prairie dog, compass plant, um, royal catchfly, black-eyed Susans, a whole bunch of wonderful plants and we find all these special prairie plants in association with one another that's why we label it how we label it a prairie doesn't mean these plants won't grow in other places beside prairies but when they're growing in association with one another we have a prairie and that's what we're standing by right now it's just part of this rich heritage now it's kind of funny big blue stem was one of the major prairie grasses throughout the entire tall grass prairie range which basically extends from eastern kansas all the way to northwestern Indiana with these outliers in Ohio. Now, after the hypothermal period, with this warming, drying period, after that ended, many of the forest trees reclaimed the landscape, but we still had these big prairie areas in Ohio. The Darby Plains, the Sandusky Plains, the Piqua Plains, a whole bunch of these large areas that were remain prairie grass long after the climate changed. But of course, the question is, why did that happen? How, how is it that these prairie species could have maintained themselves? Well, the trick is that most of these large prairie areas, and some of them were many, many, many square miles, 
were in areas that had been formerly glacial lake beds. So between the glacial till and the clay deposits in these lake beds, these sites were very poorly drained. So in the spring of the year, these, these previous large glacial lake beds didn't drain water. And so in the spring of the year, you'd have water anywhere from ankle deep to knee deep. So if a seedling or a seed from a tree fell in there into these basins, it couldn't survive. It'd be underwater, it couldn't grow. And even if it did, like around the margins, what would happen later on is that these glacial lake beds would dry out so much that the soils would crack and become extremely dry, and they'd be subject to prairie fires. And we had prairie fires on rare occasion, actually started by lightning even here in the east, but more often by Native Americans because prairie fire was part of what they did to help facilitate their hunting of game. It opened up prairie areas so they could you know, walk across the prairies more easily. And if you happen to have your village close by and you let the prairie grasses grow up, your neighbors, your, the worrying neighbors that you might have might sneak in and steal all your ponies or burn your camp. So they routinely burn the prairies as well. If you look at a lot of the maps in Ohio, you'll see that prairies are labeled as barrens. And you have to understand that when your forefathers came to this country from Europe, these were mostly farmers. And when they saw this landscape, which they had never seen before, that was treeless, they figured out that, well, if it can't grow trees, it can't grow crops. So these are barrens. And beside that, the plows that worked so well on these coasts that were made of cast iron and wood could not cut through these intertangled, tightly mass of prairie roots. And so it was worthless. So it wasn't land that they thought was available to them. These lands were really shunned by early settlers because if you were unfortunate enough to get a piece of prairie land, you couldn't plow it with your old cast iron or wooden plow. So you'd have to hire a team of what they called sod busters. And these were prairie, these were people that were that would for a price would come in with several team of oxen, several men, and a huge what they call a breaking plow, several hundred pounds. And they'd they could use this to go through and break up those roots. But prairie soils are very sticky, they're loamy soils. And so what they found out is that every hundred feet or so they'd have to stop and clean off all the, the the sticky loam prairie soil off and then start again. It was a very tedious process. And so by the time they were done, the person who had hired them probably invested more in these breaking teams for the soil for the prairie than he did for the original land. So it was a very very costly thing. So most people didn't want prairies. But then about 1833 there was a blacksmith in Illinois who got the idea that if we made our plowshare out of steel and the mold board, the mold board is, the, is above the plowshare, so as the plowshare cuts the soil, soil rubs up around the mold board and then flips over inside. The problem was with prairie soils, number one, you couldn't cut through the roots, number two, the, the loamy soil would stick to the mold board. But this blacksmith had an idea. Now that was before steel was available in, in this country, but we would import it. And what he did, he came up with the idea of taking old use saw blades that were made out of polished steel, cutting them up into sections, welding them together and making a plowshare, the blade blade itself, and also making a mold board with the idea that not only would it have the strength to cut through the sod, but it also would help roll the sod over on its side. Now, you know who that was? Most people would say John Deere, but the reality of it was, in 1833, this is a different blacksmith. This is a fellow by the name of John Lane Sr. But John Lane never patented his invention. And so, three years later, another blacksmith in Illinois came up with using his same technique, did the same thing, but he patented his invention. And he went on to sell all kinds of farm implements. You know him as John Deere. And so that's how these prairies all of a sudden became what was considered wasteland, the barrens, and became the breadbasket of North America. Because once these prairie soils could be plowed, they became, they were extremely rich because these prairie grasses tend to take atmospheric carbon dioxide, carbon, they sequester it, put it into the root system. So over thousands and thousands of years, you get these beautiful black rich prairie soils, the richest soils in the world. In one generation, almost all the prairies in North America, the tall grass prairies were plowed under. But we still had these little remnants in various areas where they were protected, maybe along streams, along highways, along railroads, pioneer cemeteries, little remnants here and there same diversity you would have found in the original tall grass prairie.